Hello and welcome to a very special Total War podcast. I'm Mark O'Connell and I'm joined today by Professor Stephen Turnbull. Hello. Hello, Mark. Hello. OK, uh, so first of all, could you tell me a bit about your background as a professor? Right, well, I'm visiting professor of Japanese studies at Akita International University in Japan. OK. And I also teach... Uh, courses about Japanese religion at Leeds University here in England. But uh, the main reason why I'm here today uh, is because I am going to be the historical advisor for Shogun 2. Fantastic. Now, you actually worked on the original Shogun, didn't you? Uh, can you tell me what it was like to work on our very first game in the Total War series? And also, what have you learned since? Well, it was incredibly exciting because, as you know, uh, the Total War series was launched by Shogun uh, with, and it was a really excellent and exciting game. Um, looking back, it seems incredibly primitive now in terms of technology because so much has moved on. That's right. But also, as you imply in your question, my knowledge has moved on as well. And I feel that the time is now right to revisit it because there is so much more that I'm able to bring to the game and advise the team about that we didn't know about. The fine detail of army organisation, uh, the colours, the landscape and so on. We seem to understand so much better than we did then, which is why it's time now for a, an upgrade. I absolutely agree. So the Sengoku period was one of almost com constant conflict. What, in your opinion, were some of the standout battles? Oh, the great ones are the ones where the emerging, if you like, super lords took each other on. So you've got the famous Battle of Nagashino, noted for the mass use of firearms for the first time on a large and organised scale. You've got the, the Battle of Nagakate, which never seemed to stop. <laughs> Over the period of 48 hours, one side won, then the other. You've got the great sieges, the siege of Osaka Castle, a fortress so large that its outer walls measured 12 miles in circumference really? wow. with 120,000 defenders. And, of course, the great battle of Sekigahara, fought in a narrow valley which has always been important to communications. Nowadays, there are two railway lines and a motorway going through it. Right. <laughs> in those days, it was where the two armies could not help but meet. And that is where it happened. And those are the examples, really, that I think we're able to draw on. Fantastic. So what were the main kind of weapons of choice that would be used in battles? Well, at this period, certainly, um, would be mounted samurai armed with spears. Mm -hmm. They're the elite warriors. You've still got some who were armed with bows and arrows, but that was regarded as a bit old-fashioned. Right. When they were on foot, they used spears, and then, of course, their famous samurai swords. Contrary to popular belief, the sword was the secondary weapon of choice. Okay. Spears were what they were trained for. But at this period, those samurai, the elite warriors were backed up by thousands of lower-class Ashigaru foot soldiers, as they were called. And they were armed with bows and arrows, with spears, but primarily with muskets. All right. By the thousand who could develop... Sorry, who could deliver a devastating volley. OK, so did they ever use explosives as well? Yes, they did, but on a, on a much smaller scale than we'd ex, uh, expect in contemporary Europe. Okay. The main gunpowder weapon of the Japanese was the handheld musket. Very little use made of cannon. The best cannon they had were uh, obtained from the Europeans. Okay. And a limited use of exploding bombs. But these weren't to destroy property. These were to, to really anti-personnel devices. Right. So as they mainly it's just the firearms. OK. Uh, what effects did the Sengoku period have on modern-day Japan? Are there still influences there? Well, one influence is that modern-day Japanese are very proud of it. Absolutely, yeah. Samurai and their history is something that's absolutely fascinating to any Japanese person who seems to know quite a lot about it. And um, I suppose, in a way, we used to say, certainly before the recession hit, that the, the lifetime loyalty that you gave to a lord in the Sengaku period was mirrored in the lifetime attachment to a Japanese company that you had now. Right. Unfortunately, of course, that's changed <laughs> for a lot of Japanese people. Absolutely. What were the, the key naval battles from the period? There weren't many naval battles at all. Um, most of the naval 
uh, combat expertise was in the hands of pirate gangs. Okay. Who didn't sort of attack other vessels. Essentially what they did, because where they were based on little islands, uh, they used to control the communication routes. Right. You see, most Japanese ships weren't big ocean-going vessels. They used to hug the coast giving lots of opportunity for these people to set up illegal toll barriers of the sea. Right. They're the ones who then became the, the daimyo's navies. And there's really only two or three major naval battles of the period. Uh, Kizugawa Guchi is probably the best example, where one side were trying to get supplies through to a castle right. that had an outlet onto the sea, and the other, the other side were trying to intercept them. But it, it's not an important element uh, on, on a big scale. Right. OK. Uh, can you tell us about death poems? Ah, death poems, yes. Um, oh, you've got some beautiful ones. Usually... Um, Traditionally composed before you committed suicide. Right. I suppose if you're going to be shot in battle, you wouldn't really have time to compose a, a Absolutely, poem. yes. But, um, oh yes, the, the death-defying ones of people who would write a poem on the back of their war fans. One man who, wrote, who carved his with an arrow on the door of a temple. Another who wrote one um, using a brush dipped into his own blood really? on the door of a shrine. Yes, um, and quite a lot of reference to Japanese culture and religious imagery, particularly the cherry blossom, which is so fleeting, Absolutely. just like the life of the samurai. Yes, there's a lot of that. Did they ever actually commit Harry Carey on the battlefield itself, or was it something that was more of their they'd dishonoured someone or something like that? A battlefield was a tricky place to commit suicide because you needed a little bit of privacy for it. Right, OK. Most of the cases you find that the, the Lord who knew he was defeated and um, was able to escape would retire to his own castle, if possible, if not to some local shrine. Right. And they, while the bodyguards held everybody off, he would commit suicide. You, you do have some very dramatic examples of suicide on the battlefield. Um, one guy was supposed to have cut his own head off. That's impressive. How would you even go about doing that? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm sure... Well, I suppose it's theoretically possible with a samurai sword. And if you had tremendous self-control. Absolutely. Otherwise, um, it took a little longer. OK. What did it actually mean to be a samurai? It meant that you were an elite in social terms, in military terms, in behavioural terms. You were the top... You, you were the man who belonged to a social group before whom everybody else bowed the knee, and literally did bow the knee. Right. Theoretically... They had the right to cut down anyone who offended them, okay. theoretically. So it's almost like a licence to kill, almost. A licence to kill. I mean, it wasn't really carried out, and in fact you'd be in grave problem if you used that as an excuse just right. to go around slaughtering, but that was murder. Absolutely. But theoretically they had the power of life and death over other people. OK. I overheard someone in the office talking yesterday about warrior nuns and also lady samurai mm. or onabushi. Can you tell me a bit more about those? Yes, this is it's one of the, like, the newest research projects that I've done myself. I went to Japan specifically for it last year. OK. I was amazed to find so many examples of women warriors in action, even women armies, but... The one caveat on it is it, it tends to be in a very specific situation. A castle is being attacked, usually by surprise, but the lord who owns the castle uh, is elsewhere fighting a battle, which is why there's been the surprise attack. And I was amazed by the number of examples of such situations where the women of the castle would band together and fight alongside the men, including going out of the castle as a group and, and, and taking on... Um, the enemy samurai. All right. You don't have women armies in the sense of let's go around and recruit a woman army. Right. It's never a conscious decision, but it's a situation where they were driven to it, mm. and they were trained in martial arts, so they were ready for it. So they're essentially a reserve. Yeah, the, 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 they were always ready to defend if they had to, and in certain extreme cases, they did. Now, earlier on you mentioned pirates. What kind of tactics did they actually employ? Well, again, it depends what you mean by pirates. Um, for, 
in Japan itself, they were mainly sort of intimidation tactics. Right. Pay up or we seize your ship. Okay.、Um, the idea of sort of attacking to repel borders and things like that. You don't really find that. What you find that is when they carried out pirate raids against China and Korea, which were very savage. Right. But you don't really have examples of that within Japan. What you do have are these small scale naval battles where the ships、um, refused.、Right. And there you've got the、um, fire arrows and、um, flying bombs and things like that. Quite, quite exciting episodes, I think. Okay. Now, one question I must ask you is who would actually win in a battle, a knight or a samurai? Oh, that's the age old question.、Yes. I mean, I've. I've helped in the past design computer games that, that, that put <laughs> Mongols against samurai and against knights. I don't know the answer. But what I will say is had the Spanish army in, say, 1610、mm-hmm. invaded Japan, which the shogun was frightened they would do, having conquered the Philippines,、right. I don't think they'd have got very far. <laughs> I. I would have put a contemporary Japanese army in the early 17th century、uh, in a very good competitive position against a contemporary European army. Really? What、yes. do you think made them so formidable on the battlefield? Well, I think the utter fanaticism、uh, of the desire to survive. And、um, I think also the, the juxtaposition of two alien cultures. I mean, if you look at the wars of the Renaissance in Europe, you've got Spain against the emerging Dutch republics and France against Italy, Battle of Fornovo, and things like that. Yeah. This is always like against like. They're against、um, quantities and qualities of armies that are understood. It never happened, but I mean, the scenario of a Spanish army or a French army against a samurai army. What a fascinating encounter it would be. Exactly. Maybe that's an idea for us for the future then. <laughs> I think so. Well, one of my new research projects I'll be doing over the next few years is into the activity of samurai mercenaries、oh, really? who fought abroad. Okay. And samurai, this is the time when the wars had ceased. The wars in Shogun II had ceased. And they sold their services overseas as mercenaries. And they fought for、um, Siam. Cambodia, Burma, the Dutch colonies, the Spanish, the Philippines. They were everywhere in East Asia. Okay.、Uh, so, finally, are you looking forward to working with us again on Shogun 2? Oh, very much so. I'm absolutely delighted to be back. It's good to have you back. Thank you very much. I say it was great fun last time, and this time it's going to be even better. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome.、And、I look forward to seeing you as the project develops. Yep, thank you. You've been listening to the Total War podcast. For more information about Shogun 2 Total War, stay tuned to totalwar.com. dot